been walking through God's word and fast forward, typically tries to remain in a series. And so today, uh, we want to begin a, a series through a book of the Bible. What did you say? It's going to be Jesus' return when you get done. No, through, through a book of the Bible. You're going you're gonna to smile when you hear the name of the book, the book of James. The book of James. <laughs> That's Deacon James Boyd who's saying amen. And so, uh, yeah, some of y'all are smiling because, you know, James is a very short book. And they say we're not going to be here through winter, spring, summer, and fall. And so the book of James. When you have the book of James, would you say, I got it? James chapter 1, I want to read to you this morning from the New King James Version, and then we'll move forward. James chapter 1, I want to read specifically verses 1 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It reads like this from the New King James Version of God's Word. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all, help me with this word, joy, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, help me, patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let me read it one more time. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. Why? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You may be seated. May the Lord be pleased with the hearing, reading, understanding, living out of his word. Let's pray together. Be pleased to Heavenly Father again to let us preach. God, not for shape, nor for show, nor for fashion, but God, let us preach till we reach each age. How we thank you afresh for all that you have already done, all that you are doing right now in this worship experience, and all that you shall do hereafter. Father, would you please let the seed of your word find good soil in our hearts. Produce much fruit is our prayer. God, would you say? Would you heal? Would you strengthen? Would you deliver? Would you set free? In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray it. Move Sherman out of the way and let your sermon, your message, be clear. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. I want to put a tag on this text and choose this morning as a subject from which to preach joy no matter what. Joy no matter what. Would you repeat after me? Everybody say, joy, no matter what. Come on, everybody together. Joy, no matter what. One more time for the road. Joy, no matter what. We're all familiar with precious items, no more particularly precious pieces of jewelry. As a matter of fact, I would bet dollars to donuts that there are some sisters in the sanctuary, certainly some ladies online, that have some jewelry that speak to what it is I'm talking about now. Precious gems. Precious pieces of jewelry. One precious piece of jewelry is called the pearl. Let the whole church say pearl. We know about a pearl, and we know about the formation of a pearl. Another is called a diamond. Let everybody say diamond. Now, I know you know about a diamond. <laughs> and the formation of diamond. I want to remind us this morning that when it comes to the creation of a pearl, that God has an unusual way to do that in nature. You remember that the pearl is formed in a shell, and when that creature in the sea is doing its work, it begins as a grain of sand, and over time, watch this, and through irritation, <laughs> don't miss that, the pearl is formed. It takes time, everybody say time. 
It takes irritation. Everybody say irritation. And what happens is that there is a secretion. There are some things that uh, go on on the inside that forms a pearl that at some of us are now wearing on our fingers. Some of y'all got it around your neck. Some of y'all may have it on your toes. Pearl. Let me make this statement. You help me finish it. A diamond is a girl's best friend. All the ladies said it in unison. Y'all like some diamonds. But just like the pearl, the diamond is fashioned and it's shaped and it's produced over time. I'm talking about the real diamond now, not the one that's artificially created in the lab. I ain't talking about a lab diamond. Nothing wrong with that. I ain't cutting nobody with a lab or an old one. But the point is that diamonds take place. They come to formation and then they end up in many cases on our personhood over time. Like the pearl, the diamond is fashioned through difficulty. And then when you go to the jewelry store and you pick out the kind of diamond you want, they'll ask you, do you want a princess cut? Talk to me, somebody. they ask you, do you want it like this? Do you want it like that? How many inclusions uh, are you willing to put up with in the diamond? Let's segue now from diamonds and pearls. Our whole church is praying for me right now. If you're a guest, <laughs> whether you're a boy or a, I wish I had somebody, a girl. <laughs> I'm so glad y'all know me. They take time. If there's something that the church Christians around the world need to deal with today is the fact that God does his best work over time. And we don't want to deal with it because it's irritating sometimes. It is uncomfortable sometimes. But God can fashion and form and fix us and then fit us to be a jewel in the crown when we're willing to endure difficulty no matter what. The book of James, everybody say James, is a book that is, watch this now, written by the follower of Jesus Christ called James. There are several theological arguments. We won't go into depth into all of them. Uh, I am here to share that the James who writes this letter, this book of James, is the biological half-brother of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Did the mic come through? He's the biological half-brother of Jesus Christ. You remember that Jesus is born to Joseph and to who? Mary. You remember that he's the firstborn child, but we will also remember that he has at a minimum five siblings because their names are listed in the New Testament. The Bible calls them like this, James, Joseph, Judas, and his sisters. Since sisters is in plural, he had at least two. That means five. Can you imagine being the younger sibling of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what they had to be like going to school with Jesus as your older brother? Can you imagine perhaps the irritation, come close, the subjugation to pain and to difficulty and the slander on the schoolyard? I mean preschool, elementary school. I mean junior high and high school. Can you imagine? Yeah, your brother Jesus. Claiming to be the Messiah, right. We don't like you or your family. Your father Joseph ain't right. Your mama is a little sadistic. We don't know what's wrong with her. But can you imagine how children and other families treated Joey, Mary, and their children? Here comes James now. He's Jesus' younger brother and possibly the firstborn after Jesus because when the Bible lists the names of his siblings, he's listed what? First, how do you follow Jesus? <laughs> and then when he turns 30, there he is, he Jesus now, being baptized by John in the Jordan. And then when he turns 30, here he is, Jesus now, no longer just taking up the same uh, carpentry work that is a stone mason in Bible language. He didn't do necessarily uh, uh, nails and hammers. No, Jesus worked with metal. He had a hammer. 
Somebody said, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I wish I had somebody. I'd hammer in the evening all over this land. I'd hammer out justice. Jesus had, in the words of Popeye the sailor, muscles. At 30, he goes public. He goes to a wedding. The Bible says that his mother and his brethren were there. And that's where he performs his first miracle, turning water into wine. Now, again, just imagine being James. There he goes. Showing off again. Historians believe that because they were so close to Jesus, that it is highly possible that his siblings were the last to believe in him. Come close. Anybody here ever been so close to someone that you didn't recognize their brilliance until they were gone? Uh, you didn't recognize their personhood, my brothers, until they exited the scene. And it's highly possible that we recognize them and we love them with our entire cardia, our whole cardiology, our whole heart, while they were here. But am I alone in believing now that I recognize and respect and revere and love and send the royalty in ways that I never did while they were yet breathing in bodies down here. John Dewey Fort Jr., my father, and Juanita Olivia Haynes Fort, my mother. Anybody here beside me recognize people differently when they're gone? James doesn't come to faith in Jesus according to the historical record, until after his burial that follows his crucifixion and his resurrection. Tell your neighbor real quick, don't wait too late. Oh, my goodness. Don't let him have to die for you to appreciate who God has put in your life. And amen goes right there. Don't wait for your mother to die, your wife to die, your husband to die, your children to pass on, your best friend to be gone in order to appreciate all any guests who are here that maybe didn't stand, say, Pastor Ford's taking a while on this sermon. L listen, uh, uh, at this church, this preacher pastor believes context is king. Because <laughs> if you get off on context, then you're going to build the leaning tower, I wish I had somebody, of Pisa. So we see James now. He's a brother of Jesus. He comes to faith after his brother is resurrected from the dead. Because he finds it hard to believe that his brother is the promised Messiah all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And let's not blame the family. Let's not blame them because if this has been a prophecy from Genesis 3, and you're now all the way in the New Testament, some of us would be a little skeptical too. And, and, and there were other people who claimed to be the Messiah, and they were proven to be false. James now knows who Jesus is. He knows that Jesus has uh, not only been crucified, but he's resurrected and ascended. James is now a follower of Jesus like others uh, who are followers of Jesus are not. He knows Jesus at the breakfast table. <laughs> and he knows Jesus as the preacher prophet. He opens up this book, this title now to our new sermon series, and I hope that you'll be here every week. Joy no matter what. <sighs> Anybody here going through? That's why you can't shout yet. You don't want to admit it. I don't omit it. Sherman, are you going through? Yes. Fingers, legs, hands, feet, because we live in this world. In this world, you may be living in some kind of cocoon of fictional <laughs> circumstance. But the world is not a kind world right now. Well, watch what James says to all of us. He says, James, yes, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy. What? When you fall into various trials. What? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Pardon me? But let patience have its perfect work. You're not making sense. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm going to do it, okay? Joy and pain, like sunshine 
Don't say it again, but now, nah, Joe. <laughs> James is making a case here that the world he's living in at the writing of this text is a world of contradiction. He identifies himself by saying, I'm James Sherman. Yeah, I'm the bond servant. Watch the language of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The term bond servant may be translated in some more contemporary versions as slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The difference here with this word bond servant is it is a word that I am a bond servant. I am serving in a bond relationship, hold it by choice. This is not Kunta Kinte trying to run away from the master's house in that classic television series, Roots, because he's a happy bond servant. See, Kunta Kinte was leaving the crib, the house, the domicile, the digs. He was leaving that plantation trying to get his way back to Africa. I know y'all are uncomfortable because I just brought up something. It's all right. Everybody's going to be okay. James is saying, I am willingly laying down my life to my Lord, my liberator, my boss, my redeemer, my God. I am in service to him. As a matter of fact, I have a contract. No, Sherman, I have a bond relationship with him. Hold it. And also, yes, James, to his son, my elder brother biologically, my Lord and liberator, my savior and sovereign, Jesus Christ. See, the key here is in verse, with the key here in verse 1, when he talks about Jesus Christ, is when he uses the word Lord. You see right there? And of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word the before the word Lord is in definite article, the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. There are other people with the title Lord, but I'm telling you that I am serving my elder brother. How many of us want a church of service? How many of us want a life of service where we're going to serve because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us? So James is saying, listen, I know that he's my brother, but he's my Lord. Some of us would have a boxing match with our sibling. If <laughs> instead of calling him Lord, they would, some of us would say, Ninja, please. Some of us would say, I ain't calling you that. Mama called you Mary. I'm calling you Mary. And he says, Lord Jesus Christ. Watch, watch the rest of this context. He then says this to the 12 tribes, watch this language, which are scattered abroad. He addresses the letter by an acknowledgement, but then by, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, but then he addresses the people that he's writing to. Now watch who he's writing to, church. He's writing this to the 12 tribes, the entire nation. We remember the 12 tribes in the Old Testament. The Bible gives us the list of all 12 tribes. He says, to all the 12 tribes of Israel, now watch his language that are scattered abroad. Understand the context of the book of James is that he's writing to people, watch this now, who are God's chosen people, but they're scattered because of tribulation and trial and testing and war, and they're no longer together. They're just scattered all over the place. Anybody here got a scattered family? Don't, don't, don't answer a lot. And, and I don't just mean scattered geographically. Somebody's on the West Coast. Somebody's on the East Coast. Somebody's North. Somebody's South. Somebody's in another country. Somebody's in another, uh, uh, on another continent. I mean scattered. And they're scattered because of sin. Now, before... We go any further. Remember, we can't spell sin without putting I in the where you at, Moni? In the middle. Get this, brothers and sisters. That sin is what scatters the nation. Anybody here ever experienced scattering? I mean psychological scattering, biological scattering, I mean sociological, certainly scattering. Anybody here ever been scatterbrained? <laughs> It can be traced back to me, myself, and I. Sin. They disobeyed God, and God allowed persecution to come. 
Because sometimes persecution can teach you what mama can't. <laughs> yeah, I hear Sister Margie Keller saying, yeah, yeah. Some of us don't want to admit it. We want to omit it. But some of us were taught better or differently on the street. Mic check, one, two. Then we were at home. Mama kept saying it. Mama kept saying it. Mama kept saying it. Mama used to say, I mean, take your time, young man. <laughs> I mean, Mama used to say, don't you rush. Oh. He's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Now, watch what happens here. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Y'all don't think I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm close now. Because, again, remember, for me, context is everything. Now, watch what happens. My brother, he already identified, he's talking to the 12 tribes, and they are what? Family. We are family. I got all my, <laughs> yeah, over the years, he says this. My brother encountered all what? Joy. That's why I love this church. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. He says, count it all joy. That's the crux. I'm suffering. I'm in pain. We're scattered. We're being beaten, bruised, bludgeoned. We're being murdered. We're being uh, burned at the stake. We're being fed the lions. And boy, you just wrote us a letter <laughs> and told us. You just wrote us a letter, James, and told us to count it all joy. What are you going through that is uncomfortable? Count it, Joe. What, what are you dealing with? The messy marriage? What are you dealing with? Crazy kids? What are you dealing with? Your own psychosis? What are you dealing with? A biological infirmity? What are you dealing with? A sociological <laughs> matter that may or may not be of necessity? That's a reference for me to our political world here in these yet to be United States of America, R-A-T, that's right now. What, what are we dealing with? High prices on everything we purchase and low quality on all things we receive? What, 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 what are you dealing with? People on the street, particularly those who try to have car courage, meaning that they won't get out of their car, but they'll act bold while they're in the car. What, what are we dealing with? Racism, sexism, but the real ism that Jesus is still Savior and Lord, no matter what we're dealing with. The Bible says, count it all joy. That's the word. Joy comes from a New Testament word that speaks to the state, watch this now, of our faith and not the state of anything else that's fit. Because I can have joy no matter what as long as I'm leaning and depending on Jesus. Yeah. Years ago at this church, when we used to have names for all of our groups, you know, the, 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 the children's ministry was jam, Jesus and me. We are jam, and we love to sing. We worship the Lord because he, that was our song. He is king. Then we had um, the young people were, were, were joy. Jesus obsessed you. <laughs> and we had names like that. Y'all remember those days when churches had names for every auxiliary? I mean, the little children were the what band? The Sunshine Band. Me and Corey, the only ones who been in church. The Sunshine Band, Corey. Nobody else knows that but you and I. Just. Everybody else thinks it's the cloud crew. I don't know. The sunshine band. Joy comes from a word that speaks to us not living in a state of mind that's going to make us go crazy and make us go nuts. They're going to put us in a going to put us in a truck. And guests are going, "Are you quoting what I think you said?" Yes, I am. 
Joy is what we get from God no matter what circumstance we're in. When the world is losing its mind, we have the Messiah, our mediator, who lives inside of us and balances us out. Now that deserves a shout of praise to God. I'll be done here. The Bible says this, count it some joy. Count it one-third joy. No, James says, hey, y'all, yeah, count it all joy. Watch this now. When you fall into various trials, knowing, there's the next word, that the testing of your faith produces patience. Here's the next key word, knowing. Now, the reason why we can trust God with great joy, Reverend Kevin Swindle, is because the God we serve has already proven himself strong. I so want to take this mic out the stand right now because I feel like we could shout on the fact that all of us have a record where God has proven himself strong, that all of us can testify that when I was going through what I was going through, that God, Deacon Larry Wayne Davis, has proven himself strong. We sing a song, that problem that I had, I had, I just couldn't seem to solve, too soft. I prayed and I prayed, and I just got deeper involved. And then I turned it over to Jesus, and I stopped worrying about it. I turned it over to the Lord, and he worked it out. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus will work it out if you let him. <laughs> I ain't going to go to verse 2 and 3 because y'all ain't ready now. He says this, knowing. It is the fact that we can rest and we can relate and we can still go to real work, but we know that God has everything worked out for our good. I don't care what you are dealing with politically, what side of the aisle you're on. God is not an American. Mic check, one, two. God is not from Europe. He's not from Africa. He's not from Asia. He's not from any one of the seven continents. See, God is God. Let me say it again. He's Elohim. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Sitkanu. He is King of Kings. Preach, Sherman. He is Lord of Lords. Preach, Holy Spirit, through this message. And we're going crazy over politics. Like we got some kind of power. You ain't got no power. Now, go vote now. I ain't saying that now. I'm not saying don't vote. Matter of fact, you have a Christian responsibility to vote. Mic check. You have a Christian responsibility to vote. We have a Christian responsibility to vote. I'm not registered. It ain't too late. You can get registered. You can go down to your polling location. Matter of fact, next year I'm praying that they'll use our church as a polling location. And folks will come here and just cast their vote. You vote every day. You might as well vote for Jesus at the polls. You say Jesus isn't running. No, but the Holy Spirit can give us divine direction based on our Christian conscience, C-O-N with, prefix, science knowledge. He'll tell us which way to go. You say, I'm going to vote independent. Well, vote independent. If that's what the Lord tells you to do. I'm done. Testing of your faith produces patience. They know I'm trying to finish now, but let patience have its what? Perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking what? Nothing. To our two guests that were recognized this morning, the other guests, if you're here, you don't want to stand. Our whole church knows he's really closing now. When I roll the pulpit off to the side and I start coming down, they're like, okay, we got about three, four minutes left. Pastor's almost done. Here's what I want us to get from the book of James. And I hope that you'll be here every week. God wants us to have joy. No matter what. And we can come to church again and put a $100 hat on a 10 cent hood. We can come to church again and put white gloves on dirty hands. 
We come to church again and put on a blue suit and have a blue mood on the inside. We put on a white shirt and have a great heart. Joy is putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Pastor, that make no sense. It's counterpunctual to our society. I know that. But Jesus said, Sherman, if any man would gain his life, he has to lose it. Jesus is always counter, isn't he? We say, I, I need to gather to my house. What do the men say? I'm going to gather to my barn in the parable. And, and I'm going to take my ease. And Jesus says, man, you fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. You're going to do what now? I'm going to gather, Lord. I'm just going to gather, and I'm going to gain, and I'm going to get, and then I'm going to hold it in my garage. I'm trying to contemporize the parable for you. And Jesus said, you're not doing any of that. Tonight, <laughs> you're going to die. And then who shall all those things be? Anybody here ever get been caught up in the trap, the tragic trap of gathering everything you can gather to yourself only to never enjoy it? Yeah, God has a way. Some of us I know, we don't, God has a way. How is Jesus able to do that, all that he does? Well, I should do this every Sunday. I, ain't, I haven't done it every Sunday in probably two, three years. How is he able to do what he's able to do? The Bible says on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. It was the symbol or the emblem of suffering and shame. And Jesus died on that cross. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. They dropped him low. He hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. Boom. And Jesus died. They took him off the cross and they placed him in a borrowed tomb. Borrowed because he only needed it temporarily. He was a good savior. He stayed there all night Friday. And then all day Saturday. And then all night Saturday night. And then early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And because he lives, so do we. Thank you, Lord, for the sermon and for every circumstance that we've had to endure. I pray now for these, your people, they're mine by stewardship, they're yours by ownership. All of us are. Would you give us a renewed sense of joy? And we know that as a diamond and as a pearl is shaped that it takes time. But shape us and mold us after your will. While we stand waiting, yielded and still. What are we saying, God? Would you have your own way? Have your own way. You are the potter and we are the clay. I pray, God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know your Savior, they come saying, I want to be saved in Christ's name.